At first light on May 18th, the Union Army resumed the advance toward Vicksburg. The roads were littered with discarded blankets, weapons, and all sorts of other things that were evidence of how demoralized the Confederate troops were following their defeats at Champion Hill and along the Big Black River. The Union Army, on the other hand, marched with the confidence that they would soon take the city of Vicksburg. However, it wasn't to be that simple. Due to the necessity of crossing the Big Black River and the different means by which they crossed, the three Army Corps and Grant's Army uh, arrived at the Vicksburg perimeter at different times on the afternoon of the 18th. The first troops to arrive were Sherman's 15th Corps who approached Vicksburg from the Northeast. Uncle Billy, as he was called by his men, sent forward his skirmishers who quickly drove the Confederate pickets into the city's main defenses, including a place called Stockade Redan behind us. They then unlimbered their artillery, which opened fire on the enemy works, and they also sent out scouts to reconnoiter the defenses of Vicksburg. Sherman quickly realized that the defense was very strong, and adding to the natural strength of the uh, defenses were trees that had been felled into the ravines. They'd also dug deeper pits in some places in which they placed sharpened bamboo uh, and cane to stick up. A number of fence lines also ran across Sherman's front that would slow down the advance of his troops. As the sun rose on May 19th, 20 guns positioned along this ridge opened fire on the Confederate works and bombarded them with solid shot and shell, which tore large holes in the fortifications. The thick smoke of the guns shrouded the fields, but at two o'clock the guns fell silent and Sherman's troops deployed into line of battle astride the road behind me, known as the Graveyard Road, which entered the Confederate defenses from the northeast of Vicksburg. Major General Frank Blair's division was selected to make the main effort. Blair deployed Colonel Giles Smith's brigade north of the road and Colonel Thomas Smith's brigade to the south. Brigadier General Hugh Ewing, who was Sherman's brother-in-law, uh, his brigade was also deployed north of the road in support. With a huge cheer across the blue lines, the men poured into the ravines that you see behind me, flittering their way through the defenses at the bottom which destroyed all semblance of an order of lines. Sherman soldiers clawed their way up the slope behind us. North of the road, the men of the 1st Battalion of the 13th U.S. Infantry braved a murderous fire that claimed their commander, Captain Edward Washington, but they planted their colors on the exterior slope of Stockade Redan. Unfortunately, only a handful of federal soldiers made it to the enemy works. The rest were pinned down well short of their goal, and by the end of May 19th, they fell back in failure. But ever determined to take the city, three days later, Grant would once again hurl his army, this time the entire army, against the Vicksburg, Vicksburg defenses. At 6 a.m. on the morning of May 22nd, more than 200 Union cannon along a three-mile front opened fire and bombarded the Confederate works with solid shot and shell for four hours. The thick smoke of the guns shrouded the fields and helped screen the men as they advanced along this road. At 10 o'clock, the designated time for the assault, the guns fell silent and down the Jackson Road behind me toward the direction of the Louisianans, a tightly packed column, four men abreast, surged as the troops of the 17th Corps led by Logan's division attacked. As each successive regiment attempted to push through the road, cut only 125 yards from the 3rd Louisiana Redan, they took heavy casualties and the bodies of the dead and wounded soon formed a roadblock through which it was difficult to pass. 
Only a few of the soldiers reached their objective. They scaled ladders to mount the works, but they were driven back with frightful losses. On May 22nd, General McClernand's Corps carried a couple of forts, I think two of the nine forts that were controlled on the Vicksburg defenses. This is one of those locations where McClernand actually advanced as far as we are now. And you can see right there where there are both blue and red markers indicating that this was a Confederate line, but this was also a place where the Union advanced. McClernand broke through and he uh, started pouring reserves in and he was convinced that this was the breakthrough that was going to end the siege of Vicksburg. Well, the siege hadn't even begun yet, really. He was convinced this would be the breakthrough that would win the battle. And so he sent messages to Grant imploring him to send more men. And, and Grant, who never really trusted McClernand anyway, uh, decided to go ahead and send troops despite the fact that he was really unsure uh, about things. And so hundreds more boys in blue died trying to exploit, the, exploit this breach. But the fact is that behind this Confederate line, there were just more Confederate lines. And the breakthrough wasn't nearly as, uh, as successful as McClernand thought it was. One of the stories that needs to be told from May 22nd happened here. It's known as the Forlorn Hope. 200 yards from here, you can see there was a Confederate fort. It had a moat around it, seven feet up to the top of the fort. The Union asked for 150 volunteers, men who had to be unmarried. That should be your first clue that it's gonna be dangerous work. For four hours, the Union bombarded that position to try and soften it up to try and make the job a little easier and then the 150 men of the forlorn hope went forward a lot of them didn't even make it to the position with their ladders they were supposed to put ladders down to allow for the assault to scale the walls most of them didn't even make it that far the ones who did were pinned down uh, and were unable to move because of the position they were in of course the assault failed and the few men of the Forlorn, Forlorn Hope who survived were all given the Medal of Honor.
after the failed Union assaults on May 19th and May 22nd, the bodies of the dead, mainly from the Union, lie strewn about the fields between the lines. It was too unsafe for anyone to go out to do anything about it. But by May 25th, the bloated and decaying bodies were becoming a real problem. The smell from dead comrades just was overwhelming and I was becoming destructive both in terms of health but also morale for both sides. And so General Pemberton sent out a flag of truce. A lot of Union soldiers got really excited because they thought that Pemberton was going to surrender but what he was doing was proposing a cessation of hostilities for the day so that teams from both sides could be sent out to collect and bury their dead. Grant agreed to this and pretty soon men from both sides went out into no man's land, I guess you would call it. Osborne Oldroyd of the 20th Ohio who were just up there where those where that house is, that was where they were stationed, wrote that he observed men in small groups, Confederate and Union, talking, laughing together. Uh, one place he saw two Union and two Confederate soldiers playing cards together. And so for the day, at least, the, Un the United States was one country again. Some Union officers actually took it upon themselves to, under the guise of helping supervise the collection and burial of the bodies, actually get close to the Confederate works and observe and try to have a better understanding of how to go about attacking. By that evening, the truce was over and men went back to their sides of the line and the siege would continue for well over another month.